Hey there, it's Joe Simons, Like Diamonds, co-founder here at Salt Strong, and yes, I am gonna be revealing the three secrets to eliminate anxiety attacks out of your life for good. Let me preface this by saying I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist or anything in between. I am a real person who dealt with debilitating anxiety attacks and just literally daily fear and anxiety in my life for 14 years before I finally mastered it. And now I'm using it as a tool to do some pretty awesome things in my life and in my family's life and my company's life, Salt Strong. And if I don't know where you're watching this or if you're listening to this on iTunes or the Stitcher or any of the podcast, this is the 100th episode. And why I'm doing this, and if you don't know about Salt Strong, we're a fishing company, and yet I'm doing something here about anxiety attacks. And here's why. We're now, at, as I mentioned, episode 100. And I look back, really just in 2019, of what episodes had the most downloads and just the most comments and feedback. And by far was the episode I did not too long ago about anxiety and alcohol. And it was the first time I really just kind of put my guard down and was just completely transparent with our audience and told everyone about the 14-year struggle I had. And I don't mean just like an occasional anxiety attack. I literally let fear and anxiety take control of my entire day, of my entire life. I lost some relationships because of it. I hurt some people because of it, which still, I, I hate that to this day, some of the people that I hurt that I truly cared for and loved. I missed one of my best friend's weddings because anxiety had literally overtaken me. I literally was sweating, my heart was beating, I felt like I was going to die, and I missed one of my best friend's weddings and lied to them and told them I was sick. I have now since apologized and told them the truth, and I, I think that was another really big moment for me, and it's not one of the three secrets, but it's somewhere in between, was just letting people know about it, talking about it. It was amazing as soon as I did come out and actually say, hey, you know, I've been struggling with this. Like this has really been uh, something I, I've had an issue with for many years. And it's amazing how many people came and say, man, I suffer the same thing. Or it's my, my daughter or my wife or spouse or whoever it might be. And it, it, it just made me feel I wasn't alone. And I'm telling you, regardless of where you are now, maybe you're in the weeds like I was. I mean, once again, 14 years, I'm not talking 14 months or 14 days, 14 years of my life, this is all I thought about. I literally would wake up sweating. I was avoiding things. I wasn't having as so much fun in my life. I had lost my purpose. I wasn't very fulfilled, all because of fear and anxiety. So if you're there, I'm gonna give you some tips. I hope you're ready to take them into your life. I know I would have paid anything. I would literally would have given everything I had for this video that I'm about to share with you today, back when I was suffering. I think that was part of the problem too. Uh, you know, I'm a little bit older than maybe some of you. I don't know where you are, but when I first started having these massive anxiety attacks, there was really nowhere to go. I didn't feel safe telling my friends. It, it made me feel like I was weak. Turns out that's not the case. I, I didn't even want to tell my, my girlfriend. I didn't want to even tell my parents. I was embarrassed by it. And back at the time, uh, I was at Georgia Tech in Atlanta and we shared one computer in our little place, our three bedroom place there in uh, downtown Atlanta. And this might sound foreign to some of you younger people, but we did not have smartphones. We did not have Wi-Fi back then. It was literally an old dial up and we had Netscape. This is pre Google and Yahoo. So we had Netscape where we could go in and do searches. But our computer was literally out in the front of everyone. So the last thing I was gonna do is type in, why do I feel like I'm dying? Why does my heart feel like it's about to explode? I had no idea what I had and I was in too embarrassed to tell anyone. So before we get into all this, if you are there, just tell someone, ask someone to pray for you. Uh, tell someone that you trust. You will be shocked at how many doors start opening up, how many people that say, you know what, you're not alone. I, I suffer from this as, uh, as well. And to me, like that was, there's another reason I'm doing this. There's another reason I wrote about it in my book, Fishing for Happiness, which is really my journey of finding more fulfillment in my life and overcoming anxiety, overcoming just the, the fear, the daily fear. I mean, I'm talking about, I couldn't even go into public so many days. I planned my entire day around my anxiety. Fortunately, somehow God gave me like the perfect job. It was inside phone sales, meaning I did not have to see people face to face. So I literally just sat in a cubicle and made phone calls. I was good at that. I love talking. I love talking to people, listening to people. So that was like the one blessing I had. And that's how I was able to get through life and actually do pretty well at that. But had I not had that, I don't know what I would have done. And maybe you're there. 
I want to give you some help. So we're going to cover three things. First of all, after my 14 years of dealing with this, I'm going to tell you what not to do. These are the traps. I tried everything possible, as you can imagine. As time went on, I finally discovered what it was. It took me a couple years to even know what I had. I literally just dealt with it and had, I thought I was just dying. I had no idea what was going on in my life, why I literally felt this, they call it the fight or flight, you know, meaning it's like being in a jungle and all of a sudden a puma or a bear or something's coming after you. That's how your body feels. It's literally reacting to this crazy amount of fear. It's all in your head, of course, but it, it Easier said than done, right? I mean, I know I for 14 years I dealt with it and I literally felt like something was coming after. That's what my body felt like, where I'm running as fast as I can, my pupils are dilated, I'm sweating. Like I, I'm just you want to get out of there. You you and, and it's it kills your body too. It drains you of everything. So I'm gonna talk about all the traps that I did. I'm also gonna talk about drugs, suppressants. I tried drugs, I called, tried a couple different ones, and, and they were good. I, I think there's a better way, which I'm going to explain here, uh, and this is just from my experience. I think maybe some people might have more severe anxiety attacks. I don't know how it's possible from what I dealt with, uh, you know, from ruining relationships and hurting loved ones to literally having to plan my day. I mean, every waking hour, anxiety and fear were in my mind. This was not something that was just here and there. So. I believe there is a better way and that I just don't think God made any of us to be stuck on suppressants our entire life. And I, I'm going to get into that and be controversial to some of you, uh, but I think with this and once you see this and if you are ready to accept this, then I think, actually I know because I've done it and a few, I've coached a few other people to do it, you are going to be able to alleviate and leave all of this stuff. So let's talk about what not to do first. So. Number one, and, and let me let me preface this by saying when I when I first went out there on the Google, on the interwebs, and started doing research when I discovered what I had, you know, I, I, I saw all kinds of stuff. And this is before even WebMD, but even WebMD today, I haven't been on there recently, but I'm pretty sure it says something about, you know, um, changing your diet and, and no caffeine, no alcohol, et cetera. I kind of disagree with that. I don't think you have to change your diet all that much. I did not. And every time I did, I got more frustrated because I had not truly solved my, my big issue, which is what we're going to talk about over here. So let me just talk about number one, and that's just, I'm going to say uppers. And let me tell you a quick little story about uppers in my life. So I went to Georgia Tech and I had a roommate, uh, she actually lived upstairs named Amy Tan. For those of you women watching who are maybe in the craft uh, the craft field that you do uh, scrapbooking and stuff. Amy Tangerine is her name. That was actually my roommate and still one of my really good friends that I keep in touch with. And yeah, she's got, she's like one of the best scrapbookers in the world. I mean, literally gets flown all over the world, which still baffles me to talk about and teach scrapbooking to women and some men who are into scrapbooking. And she's got her little scrapbook kits and Target and all that. Anyhow, Pretty amazing story. Amy, if you're watching this, I love you. So we were, uh, we were going out one night in Buckhead in Atlanta, and Amy was a designated driver. And I had been drinking that day because at the time, I was using alcohol as a suppressant for myself and for my body. It, was, it did help. I, I think alcohol can certainly help calm you down a little bit. Obviously, in moderation is the word that you should usually use after alcohol. And I was not doing that. I was literally just binge drinking and so I've been pounding alcohol. I'm getting even, I'm even getting nervous about going out because every time I, I go out, usually in Buckhead, if you guys have been there, especially at college bars, you're in pretty packed places. And just the thought of that gave me tons of anxiety. Maybe you're in college watching this, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you're packed in there like sardines and the fact that I knew I was going to be like that. And even just thinking about waiting in line for the bathroom or waiting in line for to a beer at the bar. I mean, that gave me like severe anxiety. And if you have dealt with this, you know that when you have an anxiety attack slash panic attack, it literally drains you. I mean, your body is in that fight or flight. I mean, just like if you really were running from a puma in the jungle, you were going to be worn out. You're going to be physically exhausted. And all throughout that day, I was like literally getting physically exhausted, having little mini panic attacks. So what I decided to, start, decided to start doing is someone had introduced me to caffeine pills. Yes, caffeine pills. I'm sure they're somewhat popular still on college campuses and they're easy to get. You can just walk into a CVS and get, you know, little caffeine tablets. And I started popping those things. And at first it actually kind of helped. It gave me some quick little energy. And as you know about caffeine, I was young and dumb and naive at the time. Um, it, it kind of wears off after you do so much. And next thing you know, 
I'm popping these things like one after another after another, and I had run out of caffeine pills. Once again, I've been drinking all day already. Amy's driving us out, and I was like, Amy, you got to stop at CVS so I can get some more caffeine. And she's like, are you seriously? And I was like, yeah, yeah, like, I'm, so I'm sweating already. Like, this is the last thing I need is putting more caffeine, more uppers into my body. And I still remember to this day, because I was so embarrassed. And also, I was literally, I remember sitting, this is on 14th Street in Atlanta. I mean, I'm exactly where I was at CVS. And I'm like, sitting there shaking at the counter. I'm sure the clerk is looking at me like, is this guy going to make it through the night? And I'm buying more caffeine tablets. This is the last thing I possibly need. I get in the car, I pop a couple more. Uh, swig it with some uh, some water and then go out and that entire night i remember i really felt like my heart was about to explode and i did that for quite some time until i realized i was going to cause a heart attack within myself so i tell you that avoid the uppers please 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 and that includes all kinds of different drugs anything that's just going to get your heart racing it's the last thing you need now i mentioned the word moderation earlier i still drink two little espressos per day so I think one thing that really got me down is I was reading, oh, cut coffee and caffeine into your life. And I did, and I hadn't discovered these three secrets yet I'm gonna share. And so I, it didn't work for me, right? I cut caffeine out and I got headaches and I, it, I, 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 didn't, I didn't like it. I, I, I like caffeine in my life. And maybe you love coffee just like I do. And still today, I'm telling you to do two, two espressos literally every single morning, and it has not changed anything. I think if you're doing five or six, you might have a problem and it's probably not helping your anxiety, but number one is uh, uppers. Number two is alcohol. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. If you heard my last episode where I talked about how anxiety attacks came into my life, it was caused by alcohol. It was, uh, it was my 23rd birthday and I got blitzed. I mean, uh, if you guys heard the story, I literally had my friends putting mar uh, marks you know, the one, 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 and then a, a, a cross for five on how many shots I had taken after drinking all day. And I should have had my stomach pumped. I mean, uh, I don't know how I didn't die that night. And that was like the very first like full on anxiety attack I ever had. And I couldn't shake it after that. That was just one of those tipping points in my life where it got me mentally. It literally just messed up my entire body. And, you know, shame on me for not using alcohol in moderation. And for many, many years, I used alcohol as a crutch. It was the one thing I knew that would calm my body down. And yeah, let's be honest, if you get blackout drunk, you're probably not gonna be as anxious because you don't even know what the heck's going on. That's no way to go through life. It's obviously um, not safe, it's stupid. And um, the good news though, is I don't think you have to cut alcohol. I still drink, I still drink socially. I had a mentor that told me this, just like mom always said, nothing good happens past midnight. And he told me, Joe, he's like, listen, what I found in life, and this is a very successful person who sold a business for tens and tens of millions of dollars and has done well. And he's like, I have found that there's not any scenario in my life looking back that something good happened after I had three drinks in any given day. So, you, you know, you can still do business deals. You can still go out on the golf course. You can still go out boating. You can still go out fishing by having three drinks or less and cutting you off. If you can't cut yourself off at three, then you probably have a problem. Just saying. And, and that was me too. I had to do the same check in the mirror and cut myself off at three. And honestly, I have struggled with that a lot. I'll go a couple months and I will not have any more than three. And all of a sudden there's that one thing that comes along. It's a party with the boys or it's a deep sea fishing trip. And we're all just kind of, you know, all of a sudden three turns into six. Like, oh, this is like one time only. And then it's like a slippery slope every time. So far, I'm on a pretty good trend right now. And I'm uh, holding myself accountable, accountable by going on video and saying I'm not going to have more than three. If you see me out having more than three, smack me upside the head. But anyhow, I think alcohol can still be good, just like a suppressant. A drug could be good, and I, I'm, I'm gonna be very careful how I say this, in moderation, right? If you have one beer and really just helps calm you down and you can stop and it's not impending your job or your relationships or your family life, then I think that's okay. I'm a big fan of a book called The Bible, and I mean, Jesus and his disciples were drinking wine in there in moderation, maybe one cup, one glass, one beer, perfect. But I'm telling you, if you want some help on the alcohol stuff, either quit, go cold turkey, or try that three drink minimum. I mean, sorry, <laughs> maximum. Try that three drink maximum and keep drinking to a minimum. So alcohol, do not do it in massive quantities or you will get hurt and make your anxiety a whole lot worse.
Number three is diet. I read so many places about changing diet, about spicy foods. Maybe you've heard that spicy foods can trigger anxiety attacks and, and all these different like weird things about certain fruits and vegetables and meat. And I tried everything you can possibly imagine. And speaking of alcohol, like for a while I was like, well, maybe it's I'm drinking the wrong beer. It's got too much yeast. And so I went to wine and then I went to liquor. And like, no, like none of this stuff really matters unless you get control of what I'm about to share in just a little bit. And so I think if you're if you're sitting there trying the diet fad or something that you someone told you, my, my personal opinion is that it's not gonna change things that much. Yes, it might slow your heart rate down, it might give you a little bit more calmness. But this is not really going to help. And this caused me so much frustration because once again, for years, I was trying a mixture of all this stuff about cutting all the stuff in my life and having the healthiest diet. And it was really, really frustrating that it didn't work. The fourth one, and this is so critical these days. I'm sorry to have my back to you. And it's comparing yourself to others. Ever done that before? This guy has. So this day and age, why I say is so scary right now, social media. I mean, to me, that's almost a disease in itself. We sit there and we get like this high every time someone likes a comment or comments back on our post or a picture or video, whatever it is. And I'm just as guilty of this as well. I, th I think many of us uh, are. And when I was dealing with all this anxiety, I found myself all the time comparing myself to others. Meaning, I would say, "Oh gosh, man, why don't why don't any of these other people have this? Why why is it just me, God? Like, why why am I suffering from this anxiety?" Turns out, millions of other people's were. And what I found is, everyone's suffering from something. Everyone, and I'm sure you're shaking your head, everyone has something they like to improve in their life. Everyone has something that's not perfect in their life. And I think the big problem with social media is that you're basically just seeing the best version of these people on social media. Does that make sense? Meaning a lot of these celebrities and people that we see on TV and the magazines and on social media, you're only seeing their best version. You're not seeing all the crap in their life. You're not seeing all the stuff they're going through and why so many celebrities and famous people are getting divorced at the highest rate of all time. Most of them are not that happy. Most of them are not that fulfilled. Most of them have a lot of issues. And yet we're sitting here comparing ourselves to them and comparing ourselves to others and I'm telling you that is a really really wicked wicked spiral downwards and that's why I, I don't know if you guys heard my first episode or not but I talked about my friend Brooke who took his life committed suicide and a lot of it had to do with comparing himself to others I know because I was doing it I mean that was it I was at my lowest lows the time when I got depressed was when I was struggling with all the anxiety and I was comparing myself to others, thinking I'm the only one in the world that's dealing with all these issues right now. And, and I, I hate it for Brooke, I hate it for his parents. His parents reached out to me and I'm praying for all you guys, uh, your entire family. Uh, it, it's devastating that it happened. It's devastating all the people that are taking their lives. And a lot of it has to do with comparing yourself to others, thinking that you're never gonna get out of this rut and that other people have it so much better. I'm telling you, you are not alone. We are all struggling with something, and including me. I mean, I still struggle with certain things and I still struggle with anxiety attacks occasionally. However, I have been able to master them pretty quickly. Now, anytime I get in that little rut, which happens once or twice a year, instead of every single day, I literally follow these same three steps I'm gonna share with you and boom, it's like it's automatically gone. So let's talk about suppressants, which could be any kind of drugs. I'm not gonna list them out. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but I, I did a, I feel like I did a disservice on the first podcast where I, I kind of poo-pooed on, on drugs. And if you, whether you heard the story or not, I'll just tell you what happened. So I finally went in, I knew what I had, and I finally had the courage. I'm out of college now, I'm an adult, I have a real job, and I went in to see a doctor. Told him everything that's been going on, self-diagnosed myself that, hey, I, I'm, I'm dealing with anxiety attacks, and kind of just told him my, my story, and he gave me drugs. And I went out of there like freaking high five, and like I was pumped up. I was like, finally, I got a shortcut. I got the pill, baby. I'm gonna be cured. Let me tell you something, it didn't really happen that way. Yeah, it was a suppressant. It certainly took down my anxiety levels. Like I felt, I truly felt better, but I, I, I found out on the phone 
I didn't feel like I was myself. I feel like it was kind of, it was kind of changing, uh, just changing my behavior. It was changing my energy. It was kind of dumbing me down, I guess is the word I use. It was dumbing down my energy. I didn't feel like I was the Joe Simons that God had made me to be and wanted me to be. And it hit me real hard, this girl, Jeanette, I'll never forget this phone call. I was calling uh, one, of my, uh, one of my financial advisors, named Paul in Boston. And Jeanette was his assistant. She always answered his phone. We always talked. I had a great relationship with them. And, and, and she said, Joe, like, I meant to say something to you last time, but um, is everything okay? And, and now I'm almost having like a little panic attack thinking. I was like, what, what do you mean? What's, of course it's okay. And she's like, you just, you just don't sound like yourself. And this is over the phone. She's not even seeing me face to face. She's like, I don't know. I, I feel like I wanted to say something last time, but you, you just don't have that same energy, that same spunk about you. And that was when it hit me. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to rely on these. I, I, I know there's got to be a better way. Once again, I know this is controversial because a lot of you are on suppressants, but I think you can get addicted to this just like I got addicted to uppers and alcohol and stuff thinking that's the answer. It's a crutch. That's all suppressants are. That's all drugs are. It is a crutch. That's all having one, one drink before going into something that maybe is a little bit uh, anxiety causing or fear causing. It is a crutch. No matter how you want to, no matter how helpful this is, you know that. And I personally believe, for me, I don't know about you, but I don't think that God put me on this earth to have to rely on some crutch to get over something that's all in my head, because that's all it is, right? And and I, if you're struggling with this, don't take this like, oh, I'm a jerk, because I dealt with this for 14 years. I knew it was in my head just like you do, and I'm telling you, I'm going to give you the secrets to get it out of your head and to finally get control and freedom in your life. And I truly believe that getting rid of the drugs, getting rid of the crutch is going to be one step in the right direction. I don't think there's any problem with using a crutch, if you will, for a little while. Just like if you break your leg, it's okay to use a crutch for a little while. But I don't think you're, you have to use it for the rest of your life. That's just me. That's my thoughts on, uh, on drugs. So you're probably wondering about the three secrets. So I'll start with number one because we talked about it on the last podcast, and this was we got we got so many questions. It was all about breathing. Now I thought breathing was the corniest thing I had ever heard. I started reading everything about yoga and meditation. I bought some courses. I bought some online courses on how to cure anxiety. I mean, I literally tried everything and. I just felt it kind of corny. I think it's because I didn't have these other two things I'm going to share with you. And you know, because I, I, I just thought, it was, oh, it's someone doing, and it turns out that's not. I mean, think about when we're born. What's the first thing that happens if we want to actually have any chance at living? You have to take that first breath. There's so many analogies to how much breathing, proper breathing, has to do with successful life and health. I mean, even books like this, and I, I mentioned Think Grow Rich, and I got this one as well uh, to talk about, about more about the mindset type of uh, stuff we're gonna talk about in a bit, but they even mention, and towards the back of this, about how powerful proper breathing is. I mean, this is written back in the 1930s, and they knew that then the monks and people who have been the calmest people ever in other countries who've been around a lot longer than us here in America have known about the power of proper breathing and how that can actually help out your mental health along with physical health, et cetera. So with breathing in particular, my story was, and this hit me like just, man, a bag of rocks on top of the, the side of the head was my brother Luke and I were signed up to go do a free diving course in South Florida. And the free diving course basically takes you from wherever you are now to get down to 66 feet underwater free diving in one weekend. So like, I'll give you my brother's numbers. I never even made this trip and, and the whole revelation happened after he got back. So my brother could hold his breath for like a minute and 20 seconds, a minute and 20 seconds. Two days later, after going to this course, it was three minutes. He could do a, he doubled his breath hold. He was able to go down about 30 feet. He got down to 66 with no problem. He's even able to hang out down there for a couple of seconds before shooting back up the top. Game changing. And guess what? It all came down to breathing and mindset. Breathing and mindset. Crazy, right? And so I'm asking Luke, I, had, I missed the whole thing. It was like, it was almost like if you believe in evil and powerful forces around you. It was crazy. So the next day we're going to do this, I already paid my $300 to do this course. My wife gets like deathly ill, like no explanation whatsoever, like deathly ill, like literally fell down on the bottom of our stairs, deathly ill, like hospital, deathly ill. 
still don't know what happened. It was crazy, and she recovered like two days later, but it, it forced me to miss this. It was almost like someone didn't want me discovering this. So Luke gets back. I'm telling you, this is, this is crazy how it all works out. And I'm asking Luke, hey, like, how, what, was, what was the trick? And he said, man, it was breathing and mindset. It was so much is in your mind, and the rest is breathing. He's like, what do you mean breathing? He's like, well, here, here's all they're really teaching you. They're teaching you to breathe so slowly and so perfectly that you calm your entire body down to the point that you can actually hold your breath longer. And, and he used the word like the fight or flight because when you're down 66 feet down or even 30 feet down, your body is telling you that something's wrong. It is that fear, right? It's the same feeling, it's the same body reaction that you have if you're in a jungle and there's a puma coming after you. Your body is telling you to go up to the top as fast as humanly possible before you die. And he's like, you're basically tricking your body to get on the opposite side of the spectrum so you can stay down longer. So it's a, a longer term before your body gets in that fight or flight. And I'm sitting here like goosebumps because my brother does not know that I've been suffering from all this anxiety. Like I hadn't told anyone. I, I, I told my wife at this point, but like my brother had no idea. And so I'm sitting here like, all right, yeah, what, what else? What else? Like, what do they tell you? And he shows me and I tried it. And I'm going to do this for you so you guys can see it. And everyone's lung capacity is a little bit different. And I think this is another thing that irritates me about what's on the web or lack of what's on the web is they always say, here's the structure, here's the diet you need and take out alcohol and caffeine. And here's how many seconds you have to hold your breath. This is different for everyone. For me, what I found, and you can do this sitting alone in your house or before work or in your car or even while you're talking to someone. I think that was a, a mistake I thought is that, oh, I just got to calm myself down before I go into this you know, public area or a church or a grocery store or a big concert or whatever it is where I'm being around people. I'm going to calm myself down and just kind of hope, hope, hope to cope with it. And it turns out I'm using the same technique, even in packed situation, even when I'm making eye contact with someone and having a conversation with them. And here it is. One of the biggest things is making sure you're breathing with your stomach, meaning your stomach should be going in and out, not your chest. Because when you're running, like if you're sprinting, if you're having a full-on panic attack, you're breathing your chest. Your entire chest is moving. You're not breathing through your stomach. And so what I mean is this. One, I'm going to breathe in through my nose. I'm going to inhale through my nose and then exhale out my mouth. And you'll see my stomach will start moving. And I go like this. And usually for me, it's four seconds in through my nose and then a calm eight, six to eight seconds out. And why I'm doing this, in my head, I'm saying this to myself, I'm actually used saying the word relax, relax. And I, I think that guy that from Brandon Burchard uh, mentioned that, if you guys don't know who he is, awesome, awesome guy. And he was talking about how he just calms himself down. And I even do this while I sleep. As my wife will tell you, I can literally go to sleep usually within one to two minutes. And I use this as the same technique. If you're having trouble sleeping, even if you don't suffer from anxiety, this is exactly what I do every single night. Anytime I get restless, I'm like, all right, let me do my little breathing technique. So here's what I do. I'm going to try to get sideways so you can see my stomach. Hopefully, I, I, uh, I didn't eat too much here for breakfast. And I just go... in and out slowly and once again you can do the same I already feel relaxed you can see I'm already probably talking calmer just doing that two times if you do that ten times your body is gonna be in a completely different state you will be calmer it is impossible not to and all you're doing is just tricking your mind just like you're doing in a free diving and maybe that's what you need if you're really struggling take one of those free diving courses I still haven't taken the course Yet I feel I know exactly what to do and I know how to calm my body down. I know how to calm my mind down and literally get rid of that anxiety, get rid of that tension, that fear by literally calming my body down through the power of breathing. Once again, through the stomach, inhaling through the nose and I'm saying relax in the back of my head and then exhaling. Now if you're talking to someone face to face, let me act like I'm just talking to you or listening. You never would know that I'm breathing out my mouth and breathing in my nose. I'm still taking the same breath. Yes, I'm listening to you. Isn't that awesome? That, that, that alone was a complete game changer for me. That got me to the level I needed to get to conquer these next two things that I am going to talk about. So number two. Man, I wish someone had told me about this when I was younger. Mission. Mission. What do you stand for? 
Why are you here? Why did God put you on this earth? What's your purpose? Why do you wake up in the morning? I, 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 it took me 37 years. I'm now 40. It took me until my 37th birthday to figure this out. No one had actually put me on the spot and asked me that. But think of, think of any successful business. Think of any successful movement out there. They all have a why. Why do they exist? Why does that movement exist? Why does that organization exist? What are they doing? This is a deep one, and I don't know the answer for you. It's going to be different for everyone. For me, it, I'll just tell you quickly what mine is, and it's changing all the time, but my first like big aha moment was that, hey, I feel like I've been put here on this earth. I feel like I suffered through all this to impact people like you. Through our company, our big mission with our company, which ties in to, to my personal why, meaning my, my, I have a personal why and a business why, is to impact families, to bring families back, back together again, right? To unite families, to unite friends. It happens to be through fishing how we do it. But to me, I want to impact people's lives. I believe, I truly believe that's why I was put on this earth. I believe I suffered through these anxiety attacks. Someone took my tea off here. Hey, my E just so I could do videos like this, just so I could impact people. And from the emails I've received so far, thank you all so much for everything you've sent and all the questions you sent in. I know that is my purpose. I get goosebumps when I think about it and all the things that, that I've done here just in the three short years of discovering this. And, and this is not something you have to do for a full-time job. I think that's what I got so confused on is I was trying to like overlap you know, hey, what I'm doing every day, you know, isn't exactly what my job is. But if the only reason you wake up in the morning is to go to work in a job that you hate to make money to pay your bills, then you need to start rethinking why you're here. I guarantee you God did not put you on this earth so that you could sit there and go to a job that you hate, spend the majority of your waking hours doing something that you absolutely don't love just to like eke your way through life to pay your bills. Think about that. And, 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 and I don't have the answer for you. This is something you're going to have to come up with yourself. But I would seriously spend a lot of time coming up with your why. What excites you? And maybe it's time for a new job. And maybe the job is okay and it's paying a lot of bills and you have something else you're doing on the side, maybe through your church or through some other organization or maybe your own little nonprofit. Or maybe it's just something you're doing with the Boys and Girls Club or helping out with, uh, with, with, a, with a spouse or a child, maybe someone, someone through cancer, someone tough in your life, that you're just helping them out and making their life better. Your why does not have to be massive. You don't have to be changing the world, but you have to be making an impact. And the second I figured that out, all of a sudden, everything started becoming more clear. Literally, the second I actually wrote down my why, and this is huge, you have to write down the why. And it's okay if it changes. Mine has been making subtle changes as I keep figuring out and thinking about it. But every single morning, I am literally writing down my why. You'll see it on our website at saltron.com. You literally see why we exist. And just if you want to know what our, our big mission is, our, our why, like why we get up is our mission is to unite friends and family through fishing. We want to serve fishermen and make their lives better through videos like this and obviously how-to coaching and then to honor Jesus Christ and everything we do. That's it. It's that simple. It doesn't have to be this long, drawn-out, one-page mission statement. It could literally be as simple as uh, I'm helping uh, I'm helping young kids who who, who don't have fathers. Uh, I'm making someone's life better. It does not have to be this massive thing. And I think that's what I got so caught up in is thinking, oh, it's got to be this awesome mission statement that you know someone's going to be framing one day. It could be a one-liner that's so simple but means everything in the world to you. That's all. And I'm telling you, when you do that. Everything completely changes. Um, in, in the book here, I talk about this little village in uh, Japan. This is Fishing for a Happiness, uh, the book where it, it's basically my five years of reading a self-help book every single week. So I, I think I plowed through close to 300 books and wrote down everything that, that I loved, everything that I, that I thought was kind of cheesy and didn't work, and everything that happened in my life. It was crazy how God put all these right books and right messages, maybe like this video for you right now, like in my life, at the absolute perfect moment. And I talk about just my transformation of getting over anxiety attacks. I, I went through cancer. I, I had a lot of bad things happen to me in a short amount of time. I dealt with some serious alcohol abuse and how I overcame every single one of those. But one really, really cool story is this village in Japan. It has the highest life expectancy 
out there and these people don't know what depression and suicide is. They, they don't even have a word for retirement. Like they're not out there killing themselves and being depressed and stuck, stuck on suppressants. They don't have drugs to help them overcome anxiety attacks. So what's their story? Well, the story is they have a little word called ikigai, which simply means your purpose, the reason you get up in the morning. And there are people, they're like, they talk about one gentleman who's still teaching karate at 103 years old. He's still teaching karate at 103 years old. If we could all be that lucky to even live that long, let alone be out of a wheelchair or out of a nursing home and literally kicking blocks and teaching young people how to use karate in their life. Isn't that awesome? So literally there in this village, once again, the most successful village of all time in terms of people not being depressed, in terms of living the longest by far they outlive every single other person in the entire world. They don't have a word for retirement, so they don't ever retire. They find something that they love, something they're passionate about, something they're wise, their mission, and they do it for the rest of their life. I think a big issue you hear about so many people who die within 30 days of retiring is their job becomes their why, their mission. And when the job ends, there's nothing left. They don't have a reason they wake up in the morning. The reason for waking up was just going to work to pay the bills, to get the retirement account, to retire at 65 and have a million dollars in your 401k. That is baloney. That's nowhere in the Bible that I haven't met anyone. And tell me if I'm wrong here. I haven't met a single person in life that said the key to happiness and ultimate fulfillment is working tirelessly to 65 at a job that you may or may not like, to hopefully get a million dollars in your 401k and you're going to retire and everything's just going to be great and you're going to sit on the beach and drink Mai Tais for the rest of your life. That ain't the real world and that's not true happiness. That's really, really boring in fact. You're not making any impact. So basically from 65 on, you're going to make no more impact in your life. You're not going to have a mission or purpose. Why the heck should you get up in the morning? Think about that. And if you're in that situation, this is a time to self-reflect. Think about your mission. Think about what excites you. Well, if you could only have one thing that you could do for the rest of your life, assuming money didn't matter and you have to pay the bills, what would it be? And then, once you've established that, write it down and then backtrack how you're going to pay for it. That's it. It's that simple. I mean, for me, mine was crazy. Mine was to impact people and bring families together through fishing. How the heck am I going to do that? I had no idea. And for a year, I did not pay myself, just trying to figure it out. And now we have a profitable company. We're impacting all kinds, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people every single month. It's, a, it's amazing. And it all took me writing down my mission, writing down my purpose, and then living it. That's it. And once again, it does not have to be the job you're doing. There's so many people that do have jobs they like that pay the bills so that they can go make an impact in their community, in their church, in a nonprofit, or even just something you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis to bring joy and to bring more fulfillment to other people. That's it. That's mission. I, and I know that might sound corny to some of you, but when I started combining these two, and I'm going to do these in the order that I discovered them. So breathing was first. I got the breathing, and it was crazy. It, that was right around the time I was writing this book, and that was the time that I started writing down my mission. And it, was just, it wasn't overnight, but it felt like overnight looking back now. And all of a sudden, all the anxiety just started going away. And I was able to go to places like church that I literally, like, I'd stayed away from. And I, yeah, I, I put God out of my life. I was, I was saved as a young person. And I, all of a sudden, these anxiety attacks were like killing me. And I felt like I could do it on my own. I was living for myself and not for God. And it, I mean, it was crazy. All of a sudden, I started putting these two things together. And I, I kind of wanted to go back to church again. And when I went to church, I didn't have to sit in the far back right corner, even though I still did that out a bad habit meaning I always wanted to have an escape route. And if you suffer from anxiety attacks, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Anytime you're in a situation where you know there's going to be a lot of people or in a place where you know you're going to be stuck for a while like church, you always have an escape route. And I went through my entire life thinking that now I don't. Isn't that awesome? And, and that's what I want for you. And I'm telling you, these two simple things, I was able to eliminate all the suppressants. I wasn't relying on alcohol and all this other corny stuff that doesn't make that big of a change. These two combined with the third one I'm going to talk about all led to a whole lot more control and a whole lot more freedom in my life. Oh, oh one more thing on this. And, and this, is, this ties in with the comparing yourself to others. On your mission, focus on you. Don't get in the rut of writing this down, like getting there and then focusing on other people. Or maybe I'm not making as big of an impact as someone else. I've done that. I am so guilty. 
I find myself doing it all the time where I see someone else making this big impact or they got, they got more people following them on social media or YouTube or podcast, whatever it is. And, and I kind of get down on myself a little bit. You have to focus on you. Nothing else matters. Your why, your mission is completely different than mine. It's completely different than your next door neighbors. It's completely different than your spouses. Your why is yours. Live it. Dream about it. Think how you can live your why and focus on nothing else. That was a really, really big one for me. And I got caught in that rut so many times, especially as I first got this a bad habit was, oh man, looking at someone else and just kind of getting this going with me. And hey, maybe my why is not big enough. I'm telling you, if your why makes you happy and you truly believe that's why you were put on this earth, then you nailed it. Live it out and don't worry about anybody else. All right. So number three. Oh boy. And this has a couple different facets and that's faith. And that's not just faith in God. I, I'm going to talk about that and talk about the impact that played in my life. That's going to be faith in yourself. Faith that you can overcome this. And this was the biggest aha out of all the stuff that I'm going to talk about here. This is the biggest aha. This is the biggest takeaway. You know anxiety is in your mind, right? You know that. God did not create anxiety. God did not create stress. Stress and anxiety, even suffering, is 100% man-made. Think about that. Stress does not exist. It's not physical. You can't touch it like a marker. It does not exist. Anxiety does not exist. It's 100% in our head, right? Let's just say we have two moms with similar kids. They both have two kids. They're both doing the same thing that day with their kids and their kids are literally behaving just as badly. One mom can completely be stressed out and lose it. The other mom in the exact same environment, exact same everything could be completely calm and just kind of shrug it off, right? It's because it's in their mind. One is letting stress, they're letting stress in their lives, the other is not. And that comes down to faith in yourself. That comes down to a mindset. And to me, as soon as I realized that I had the power, I like the mind is the one thing you can control. You can't control a lot of the things around you. In fact, I don't know you control many of them. I think everything happens for a reason. But the one thing that you control is your mindset. You maybe have heard the story of the two prisoners of war that were there in Vietnam and got stuck in the exact same prison. They were literally shot down on a plane the exact same day, went to the exact same uh, same prison. I'm sorry, this is a World War II, I believe, uh, not Vietnam. Anyhow, exact same prison for the exact amount of days. And when they finally got released, I believe it was like seven years later, one of them killed themselves. They got back to society, realized they had lost their place in life. They, they had nothing else to live for. They had no mission, no purpose. Took their life. This is a true story. And the other man who was literally eating the exact same meal, seeing the exact same thing in the cell, literally right next to this other person, became an author, did really big things. I mean, literally changed people's lives, told his story, told the story about what I'm telling you right now. I mean, literally made a massive impact in the world because he had a mission. I tell you all to say that it was all mindset. These two men were literally living identical lives for seven years. There was nothing different. I mean, I'm talking about literally the same routine, same, literally same environment, same view. Everything in their entire life was the same for seven years. Yet one commits suicide, the other does really big things. It's a hundred percent mindset. One of them cho chose, one of them made the choice to, to, to let them to be miserable, to compare themselves to others, to say, I don't have a reason to live. There's no reason for me to be here. The other one says, I'm going to make the best of this. Just like I'm doing right now. I never imagined in my life I would be on a YouTube video or a podcast talking about my anxiety and how low I got in my life. Never in a million years. But I had to make that choice. I had to make the choice to say, you know what, God, maybe this is happening for a reason. Maybe, maybe this is going to make me stronger. Maybe I'm going to be able to share my story down the road and make a massive impact out there. Maybe it's just one person I get to impact. I know I've already done that because I've seen some of the messages I've gotten. Maybe just one person, I'm going to literally change their life and help them not go down the path of committing suicide. Would it be worth it? It would be for me. So it all came down to faith, to faith that everything does happen for a reason. And this is the really, really, really big one here. It is that everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. And when you start taking that mindset and have that kind of faith 
in yourself and in God and in just this universe, that was the biggest game changer. That was when all these combined to give me the control and freedom. And here's what I mean. I all of a sudden started just slowly changing my mindset to say, maybe, maybe it's happened for a reason. It wasn't until I combined all these and I nailed down my mission where I really nailed on the head. And at one point, I actually started becoming grateful for my anxiety attacks. Grateful for my anxiety attacks. Crazy, right? But here's the deal. Did you know that it's impossible to multitask? Studies have shown, there's tons of scientists that your brain literally at any one given nanosecond can only focus on one thing at a time. We, we assume the brain is all powerful and it is because the mindset is the most powerful thing God ever gave us. But at any given one second, it can only focus on one thing at a time. Now you can use that to your advantage. And here's what I mean. If you are grateful, if your mind is thinking gratitude, it's impossible for it to be thinking anxiety or fear at the same time. Now think about that. I'm going to say it again. If your mind is thinking grateful, if I'm now sitting here and praying and saying, man, I am so grateful for the anxiety attack I just had, or I'm so grateful that this just happened in my life, whether it be good or bad, it is impossible for my mind to also be thinking about fear and anxiety. It could flip a switch in just a nanosecond, but at that moment, as long as I'm thinking grateful and believing and feeling grateful in my body, it is impossible to be fearing, uh, feeling anger or fear or anxiety. Think about it. that was a massive mind sh uh, uh, mind shift. A uh, whole my mindset was just like whoa 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 whoa. That's that's pretty that's pretty heavy stuff, right? Because every time now you're angry, if all of a sudden you start being happy or laughing or singing a song, whatever it might be that that just gets you in a better mood, it's in entirely impossible for you to have fear and to have anxiety. And let me just show you, oh yeah, it's right over here. So one of the biggest things I ever did, these are my gratitude journals. This is, so it started in 2015, I started doing this all the way up here until uh, 2019. And these are just some of the, uh, you know, and I'm doing it literally every single day. Uh, I do this religiously and I simply just write down what I'm grateful for. You can see here, uh, sometimes it's a paragraph, sometimes these are each one one day. And I literally just write down what I'm grateful for. And, and many times in there I wrote down that I was grateful for anxiety. And what that did to my mindset and my faith was massive. It changed everything. Because now once again I'm grateful for something and I'm starting my morning that way. Like life just seemed to get better. And when I started believing, you know what, everything happens for a reason and I'm grateful for all this stuff, good and bad, everything started turning good. Like literally everything just looked at, man, like that's a good thing that happened. It's crazy. And that's like, that's extreme faith. But once you get in the habit of doing that and literally writing down all the people, I write people's names down every single morning that I'm just grateful for. Maybe it was a podcast I listened to, or maybe it was someone that, that just called me out of the blue and I just write their name and I'm grateful for them. And it's been crazy the just the magic that has happened in my life. It's been amazing the doors that have opened in my life. It's amazing the God's favor that has been flooding on me when I literally just write down what I'm grateful for, not just in the morning, but all day long. Once again, if something bad is happening, you have the choice to let it stress you out. You have the choice to be anxious about it, or you have the choice to be glad about it. Or even if I'm not glad about it, you know what, God, I don't know, I don't understand this right now, but I'm grateful for it. God, I don't have any clue why you just took this person away from We've all lost love people. I mean, I'm, I promised myself I would not tear up on this one like I did the last one, but you know, you lose someone in your life, a loved one, uh, a sibling, mom, dad, kid, whatever it might be, your spouse, it hurts. And, and that's natural. You're always going to have suffering. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but there's always some silver lining. I've seen time and time again when I've lost loved ones in my life, there is always some reason. We might not discover it right away, but you will discover it quicker when you have a little bit of gratitude about it. And maybe you pray, God, I have no idea why you just took this person out of my life. I have no idea why you made me suffer 14 years of anxiety attacks. I have no idea, God, why this has happened in my life. But the second you can end the sentence by saying, but I'm grateful that it's here. Or God, I, I'm, 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 I can't wait for you to show me why. All of a sudden, your entire mindset shifts. The anxiety starts leaving your body. The fear starts leaving your body. And all of a sudden, you start building in that habit of writing down what you're grateful for every day for five years. You start becoming a little bit happier. Now, my friends, you see me like, man, I can't believe you ever suffered from any kind of depression or anxiety. I'm, I'm a pretty doggone happy guy because everything makes me happy. It's just a lot of habits of many, many years of being grateful for everything in my life. 
My brother Daniel, I write about him in the, in the book, Fishing for Happiness. He was born with cerebral palsy. And if you don't know what that means, the layman's terms, it means that all your muscles are weaker. And so my brother was born, never has talked a day in his life. He's never walked a day in his life. He's 32 years old, 33, sorry, Daniel. And imagine you, you've never had the chance to even communicate with someone. You've never been able to walk, talk, do the things that a lot of us take for granted. Never been on a date before, never driven a car, never played a sport, never done any of that stuff that we've all, been, or most of us have been able to do. And yet the dude wakes up happy as can be with a smile on his face. He literally wakes up saying, God, thank you for giving me one more day. And, and he is such an inspiration to me and so many others who have met him like, man, this, this young man sitting in a wheelchair has got the biggest grin on his face you have ever seen. And guess what? It's all mindset. And you know what? My brother has a mission. And his mission is to cheer people up and inspire them. Guess what? He's got massive amounts of faith. He has a massive amount of faith because he has two options, just like you do. He can blame God. He could say, God, you're the one that did this to me. You're the one that put me in the wheelchair. Why did you make me born? Why did that have to happen when I was born where all of a sudden I didn't get enough oxygen in my lungs? Why am I stuck in a wheelchair my entire life? He could easily take that. And, and honestly, I might not blame him, that, right? Because it's tough. I can't even imagine. I know bad things happen in my life, cancer and anxiety attacks, but I could not even imagine losing my legs and all, basically all my muscles and basically just being stuck in a wheelchair my entire life. But he has that choice, and he made the choice to be grateful, to thank God every single day. God, thank you so much for giving me life. Thank you so much for letting me be able to go out there and breathe and let me live my mission, big or small. Isn't that awesome? I'm telling you, every time I have a, a bad day, one, I think about the gratitude. I'm like, God, thank you so much. I have no idea why this is happening to me right now. It's not what I was praying for. I wish it would have gone differently, but I know this is happening for a reason. And then number two, I think about Dan the man, the guy who's, man, got every, every possible excuse to be angry at the world. And he chooses to be happy, he chooses to be grateful. I <laughs> said so I wouldn't cry, but here I go. Woo! <clears throat> I'm going to end it with talking about these, these three combined in the control and freedom. And I, I, I have to imagine that's why you're still here. That's why you're still listening. That's why you're still watching. This is what we all desire in life, right? Control and freedom. And I'm telling you, for me, regardless if it's anxiety or if it's just fear or if it's depression, whatever it is, these three things... Having a pure, a, like a very clear mission, something that's written down, something that's like, man, pure and understanding, where you can literally recite it, where you know every morning why you're waking up, that is a game changer. You gotta write it down, you gotta live it, and you, got, you gotta start waking up every morning being grateful and having massive amounts of faith in both yourself and God and realizing that everything happens for a reason. When you combine that all with breathing and relaxing your body, I'm telling you, like these three things combined literally changed my life. It got rid of all this anxiety. It got where I would never even think about having to take a drug again for this. And some of you, for especially some of the faith part, it's tough. And it doesn't happen overnight. I, I, I pushed God out of my life for a long time. And it wasn't that I hated him or you know, was blaming him for all this stuff. I, it just, I didn't feel like I needed it. And it turns out I did. And what I saw is a lot of my friends and people I looked up to that not the social media kind of people, but people who really had success and really seemed fulfilled in life and had great marriages and great businesses and were making a big impact, most all of them had amazing faith and most all of them had a big mission and most all of them had accepted God into their life and really had that faith that, man, everything happens to me happens for a reason. And I, I look at it this way, regardless if you believe in heaven or hell or anything in between, it's 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 pretty nice knowing that there is someone who created you. It is pretty nice to know someone that there is someone in control of you and, and your destiny. It is someone, it's nice to know that there's someone out there that created you for a specific reason. You think about that. Otherwise, why, why are we here? Well, what is our mission? What's our purpose? Why, why are we on this earth if we're just put here by complete random choice or by some random selection? I truly don't believe that's the case. And from all the little miracles that have happened in my life, and I shouldn't be here right now for a lot of different reasons, 
Oh, I literally died one time on no lie. That's a whole different story. I literally died when I was 16, 17 years old for a few seconds, completely flatlined on a hospital bed. I mean, there's so many reasons I shouldn't be here. But then again, I know I'm here for a reason. I know I was put on this earth for a reason. And I know you were too. I encourage you to go figure it out and, and to get with faith. Uh, I don't know what that means for you. It's going to be completely different for everyone. It doesn't mean that you have to go to church. I would encourage you to go to church and to find a group of people that you can trust and, and, and share your stories with, both the good and the bad. Uh, to me, that was game-changing, to have a group of people in a community that I could trust. It, it, was, it was massive, massive for me. But I know these things combined and make a massive difference in your life, to give you more control, to give you more freedom, and uh, if, you, if you suffer from any of this stuff or have any other questions, just like last time, I'd love to hear from you. My personal email, joe at saltstrong.com. That's joe at saltstrong.com. I literally would love, love, love to hear from you. Uh, if, if it's specific questions, if you want me to do another deep dive on this, this is the reason I did this one. I had so many questions about that breathing, about inhaling through the nose and then exhaling through the mouth nice and slow, usually four count for me and then eight out. That's something I didn't get to share enough on the last one. So if there's anything specifically or anything on the face side, because uh, once again, that was something I struggled with for a really long time. And that could be a whole nother episode by itself, because I know I just touched on it briefly. And even just how to define your mission. If you need some help with that, um, man, I have spent years now just trying to figure that out. And I feel like I finally got it, uh, got it down. So if you want help with any of that or have questions or even just a thank you, I'd love to hear from you. Love to hear how any of these things are making a difference in your life or anything else that's making a big difference in your life. And I'll leave it with uh, Ed Milet is a guy, um, you guys should all check him out. He's got one of the best podcasts and YouTube channels out there. The guy's making a massive, massive difference. And ironically, I don't know about his breathing techniques, but the dude has a massive mission and he's got a lot of faith, both in himself in a, and in God. He believes that he is going to go to heaven when he dies. And he believes the first thing that's going to happen is this. He's actually going to meet the maker, the creator. He's going to meet God. And God's going to say, Ed, or your name, Joe, whoever it might be, come over here. I want you to meet somebody. And he's going to have someone come up from behind him and say, this is who I created you to be. This is your full potential. This is who you could have become. And one of two things are going to happen when you see this person. Number one, you're not going to recognize him. You literally have not lived up your full potential. This is your full potential. This is who I created. These are all the powers, the unique abilities. I gave you all this stuff. I gave you a mission. I gave you a purpose and you didn't use it. The person is going to be unrecognizable to you. That would be a crying shame. The other option, of course, is this. And this is what I'm striving to be and what you should strive to be and what Ed strives to be. The other option is that person looks like a twin. Looks like you're looking in a mirror. Powerful stuff. I get choked up even thinking about it. So that is going to be your choice. And I, regardless if you get any of this stuff out of that, use that last one to your own good. Use your la that last one to build your own mission. You know that God's given you some gifts. Maybe you're not using them right now. I know for many years I wasn't. I was running away from them. I was living in fear. I literally wasn't using any of the stuff God gave me. Now I am. It takes getting out of your comfort zone. It takes conquering some fear. It takes doing some big things. It takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of habits. It takes a lot of gratitude. But once you do it, I know when I, when I die, I want to be able to look at that guy and it's going to look just like me. Identical twin. Not, oh man, I wish I would have done that or shoot, I screwed up. You only get one chance at life, guys. This is it. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you guys for all the support, all the love. Please go to saltstrong.com forward slash podcast to check all the past episodes. And I truly do want to hear from you. You made it this far. I would love your feedback. I'd love any other topics you want me to cover on this or any other guest that you want me to have on to cover some of these. Uh, once again, joe at saltstrong.com. You are the best.